Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this next session, and it should be an exciting one here. We have Paul Kerrer and Alex Gaynor here are going to tell us about shipping a Rust Python extension many, million times a day. So <laughs> take it away. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. So. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's nice and intimidating to see you all in one room again. Uh, we're doing this talk as a cooperative presentation, so I get the honor of introducing my co-presenter, Alex Gaynor. Alex enjoys describing himself as a software resilience engineer, which is an accurate, if understated, way to describe his passions. He currently works for the US government at the FTC. However, he is, not a, he's, he is here in a personal capacity and is not representing his employer in any way. <laughs> as for me, uh, these days, I am a Zoom-based bobblehead, and I moonlight as a security architect for Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Again, I am here in a personal capacity, although if you're a cryptographic or security engineer, I'd love to talk to you. Alex and I are co the co-maintainers of the entire Python Cryptographic Authority suite of libraries, but we spend most of our time and effort on PyCA cryptography. The goal of this talk is to tell you about how we incorporated Rust into PyCA, crypto PyCA cryptography. But first, we need to explain why we did it. And to set the table, we think security is important. As a cryptography package, we think our users expect that we go above and beyond to keep them secure. After all, if you're encrypting something, you probably care that you're encrypting it securely. PyCA cryptography depends on OpenSSL. We use OpenSSL for all of the cryptographic algorithms like AES and RSA. And before we did all of the work we're going to describe here today, we used it for parsing structures like X509 certificates. OpenSSL is written in C, and C is a pretty low-level language. This can be useful if you're trying to make an AES function that runs as fast as is humanly possible, but C is also memory unsafe. This means that it's very easy to introduce vulnerabilities like buffer overflows and use after freeze. And indeed, OpenSSL suffers from these from time to time, perhaps most famously Heartbleed, which you may have heard of. A full analysis of OpenSSL's security is beyond the scope of this talk. But in short, we think it's both reasonable to rely on OpenSSL, and we want to minimize our exposure to vulnerabilities in OpenSSL. Paul and I have done a bunch of analysis, and in general, for large code bases written in C or C++, about two-thirds of their vulnerabilities are going to be because of memory and safety. Or put another way, two-thirds of these vulnerabilities are avoidable with a different programming language. That's the case for why not C, but why Rust in particular? Well, first and foremost, it's memory safe meaning that as long as you don't use Rust's unsafe keywords, these vulnerability classes like buffer overflows and use after freeze are impossible. It's high performance in the same way C is. You can control the exact layouts of objects and memory allocations. And it's got a very modern set of tooling, such as a package manager, build system, code formatter, and even integration with Python bindings. And it's widely used. At this point, many, many of the sponsors of this conference and many other major tech companies are using Rust. Having identified that we thought Rust was a good choice for PyCA cryptography, that was really enough for us to commit to figure out how we were going to use it. But we have another motivation as well. When Paul and I look at the problem of memory safety, we see a problem that goes way beyond PyCA cryptography and OpenSSL. We see a problem that impacts operating systems and web browsers, chat applications and video and image libraries. And we see memory unsafety vulnerabilities uh, used against women's rights activists, human rights activists, nutritionists working on a sugar tax in Mexico, and ethnic minorities. And we believe something must and can be done to improve the state of security that makes exploiting these vulnerabilities so practical. Part of improving the situation is making it easier for more people to adopt memory safe languages. We have a pretty significant place in the Python ecosystem. A lot of people rely on us. As you may have gotten from the title of this talk, we have millions of downloads a day. Uh, we're, we regularly are in the top 20 Python packages on PyPI by downloads. Um, we want to use that position to make it easier for the next library that wants to adopt Rust to improve their security. As you're going to hear, we have to do a bunch of work to make this practical and realistic. We want the next person to choose Rust not to have to deal with the challenges we had to. So how did we actually go about uh, adopting Rust? Well, first we had to figure out which tools we were going to use beyond the Rust programming language itself. And the first choice we made was which library we were going to use between, for binding between Python and Rust code. We chose a library called PyO3, which wraps the CPython C API. 
It's got a very ergonomic API. It's well maintained. It has support for basically the entire Python API surface. And here's some example code creating a module with a single function in it called double that takes an integer and multiplies it by two.、Uh, we're not going to fully explain the Rust programming language, but hopefully this is pretty reasonable. Readable to you.、Uh, and and PyO3 handles a lot of the details behind the scenes automatically for you, such as converting between Rust integers and Python integers, noting when a Python integer is too large to fit into a Rust integer, all the details like that. So we find this to be pretty ergonomic. And I just want to take this opportunity to say that PyO3 maintainers have done an amazing job. The, the work we're going to describe here is really a testament to the, the quality of the library they've built. Now that we have some Rust code, we need to know how to build it. How do we make this a part of the pip install process that everybody uses to actually get our library? We wanted something that would be drop in as possible, that would integrate with our existing setup tools build process. Ideally, users would just have to have Rust installed and then everything would work. For that, we chose Setup Tools Rust, which is also from the maintainers of PyO3. It adds the Rust extensions option to the setup function and setup the py, and it kind of does what you'd expect. You point it at the directory with your Rust code, and it will compile it, put the .so in the right place, and you're off to the races. So we picked our tools, and so we put together a small little PR, just a basic integration. Create a module, one function, no problem. Everything breaks. So here's what we have to do in order to get even the most basic pull request to green. Well, first, th first things first, we need Rust to be installed in our continuous integration environment, obviously. The base image. The base image for GitHub Actions actually calls, comes with Rust installed, so we're good there. But we also run some tests in some Docker containers, so we need to install、uh, Rust into those environments. And on top of that, we also used a service called OpenDev for continuous integration, where we also need to install Rust. Fortunately, installing Rust is pretty simple, just a matter of a single line of shell script. Speaking of CI, we also used the Read the Docs service to build our documentation, and it didn't have Rust installed in its environment. This was also pretty straightforward, but we were able to contribute upstream here, sending a pull request to the Read the Docs official Docker image to add Rust to that environment. Now, anybody using Read the Docs can easily build a Rust、uh, documentation for a project incorporating Rust. Now, now we get to the more challenging pieces.、Uh, for many years, CPython has supported something called ABI3 or the Limited API. The basic idea is in exchange for using only a subset of the C API, You get wheel targets that are forwards compatible. This means you build one wheel for all your Python 3 versions instead of needing to build one wheel for Python 3.5, one wheel for Python 3.6, one wheel for Python 3.7, one wheel for Python 3.8, and so on.、Uh, we currently support five different versions of Python 3. So ABI 3 is more or less a hard requirement for us to keep this maintainable. It's also a really important user experience thing. For when a new version of Python 3 is released, we don't have to you know, scramble to get a wheel out as soon as Python 3.11 ships. Unfortunately, PyO3 didn't support、uh, ABI3. It always built libraries that targeted this full C Python C API. So this was a pretty involved fix. We had to send about seven pull requests, a few thousand lines of code, and refactoring to the PyO3 team.、Uh, and again, they, they were fantastic, contributing、uh, code reviews and even working on this feature、uh, themselves once we sort of got the ball rolling. But the good news is, this is all upstream now.、Uh, anyone using PyO3 can simply turn on the ABI3 option, and they'll be able to build ABI3 wheels with Rust. It's even nicely documented. We also ran into some build challenges with Setup Tools Rust, and Alpine Linux, and Windows 32 bit. On Alpine Linux, the challenge is that Rust treats muscle libc, which is what Alpine uses, a little specially, which the Rust maintainers agree is a bug, but fixing it's kind of hard due to backwards compatibility. As a result, we had to send a pull request to Setup Tools Rust that has it detect when the system libc is muscle and pass the right flags to Rust to not treat it specially. On 32 bit Windows, the challenge is that very often people use a 32 bit Python on a 64 bit Windows operating system. Setup Tools would get confused and think it needs to build a 64 bit Rust library because it's a 64 bit operating system. Again, fix was、uh, thankfully pretty straightforward. A small pull request to Setup Tools Rust to have it detect that actually it's a 32 bit Python on a 64 bit Windows and pass the right flags. Going through all this was pretty involved. It took us a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, to get to the point where all of the different tools we rely on supported the full range of functionality and targets that we, and in turn our users, need. The good news is that this whole cost basically only needs to pay, be paid once. Having done all this work ourselves, it's A, been smooth sailing for us ever since, 
And all of this is available to the next user who wants to pick up PyO3 or set up tools Rust. So we think we hit our, one of that, that objective of making it easier for the next person. So as we did the engineering work, we concurrently developed a roadmap for how to actually ship this. Like we are a foundational component of the Python ecosystem, and that has made us acutely aware that difficulties installing our package have profound ripple effects. Uh, however, refusing to drop support for anything or move to more modern solutions is also untenable for security and maintainability reasons. So we attempt to balance the two inherently conflicting requirements as best we can. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about how we generally make choices, why we think about these things, and how Rust altered our math. Cryptography has, broadly speaking, four unofficial levels of support. First is what we test in CI and ship via our binary wheels. These are, to use Rust's parlance, tier one targets, which we have high confidence in and have thoroughly tested. Cryptography will never sh ship a wheel for anything we do not test in our CI. Second, we provide best effort support for environments we can't test, but we are aware have significant uh, use in the real world. For these, we will accept patches, and we will potentially even perform significant effort ourselves to provide a reasonable experience. Uh, examples of this right now include things like ArmHF and MIPS uh, uh, platforms. Third, we have, yeah, sure, why not? Where we will accept patches for less important architectures and OSs, as long as they're reasonably wet written and pass our CI gates. And then finally, there is the set of things we consider entirely unsupported. For example, versions of OpenSSL that are too old, Python versions we have chosen to drop, uh, and arcane architectures where support would require significant modification of the code base. Um, a good example of this is something like S390, not S390X. Uh, if you want, to, want these things to work, you're going to have to fork us, sorry. So we have the data that we want to use, but like, we get it from this big fire hose uh, called the PyPI statistics. So how do we use that? Um, first, usage of Python versions. We actually choose to drop support. We would love to drop support when uh, the upstream drops support. This is unfortunately not practical. Uh, we drop support as usage drops under a threshold, like, for example, 5% or less. Uh, dropping a version for us is a concrete barrier, because when we tr drop support for a Python version, we tend to immediately start using features from our new minimum. This means that there's typically no way to run our code on an older Python. Uh, when we began this work, cryptography actually still supported Python 2, but PyO3 did not. We had already chosen to support Py, Py2 well past when CPython did. Uh, in fact, we had made a decision early on that we would support it at least one year past the final sunset date. Uh, and PIP had dropped support as well. But this gave us an even stronger reason to finish our deprecation. Uh, fortunately, the statistics that we had showed usage dropping very rapidly, and this was not actually an issue for us. Um, Within the set of Python 3s that we were interested in supporting, which was 3.6 and above, uh, our Rust dependency uh, that we were adding through PyO3 was not uh, affected after the work that Alex and the PyO3 maintainers had done in the previously mentioned contributions. Next, of course, operating system. Uh, we support Linux, Mac OS, and Windows directly in our CI, uh, but we, of course, provide best effort support for other operating systems like FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and, and even some more esoteric things. Uh, but of course, Linux is itself not a monolith. And at the time we were looking to ship Rust, PIP only supported many Linux wheels, which excluded Alpine and other muscle-based distributions. This meant that adding Rust would, at minimum, require Alpine users to install Rust-C as part of their build process in addition to the existing GCC and Clang requirement. GCC or Clang. I mean, you're welcome to install them both. Uh, obscure operating systems might also lack Rust targets, uh, but ultimately we decided that holding back the entire ecosystem for niche areas wasn't unreasonable, or wasn't reasonable, rather. Those unusual edge cases can and should get LLVM and Rust bootstrapped in their world, much like they did with their C compiler. So cryptography tests and ship wheels using x86, x86-64, and ARM64, both ARMv8 and Apple Silicon. We get occasional requests for various other architectures, such as ARM HF or PowerPC64 Little Endian, but as previously mentioned, we only directly support what we can test against. However, those best effort targets should still compile and generally work, so we needed Rust to export at least the broadly popular CPUs in the desktop, mobile, server, and even some of the embedded world. Rust supports all these targets along with many more, but we realized that there may be some silent users lurking where this could be challenging. So even though most of our users get a wheel, we do want to allow users to compile their own versions. This means deciding on a range of OpenSSL versions to support. We, uh, we support various versions of LibreSSL and most recently BoringSSL in addition to all the versions of OpenSSL that we, actually, uh, that we currently have supported. Uh, 
The PIP data that we get is critical in making these decisions about when we can drop older versions, which frequently carry significant support burden. But it didn't affect our Rust release, so I actually mention it here only for the sake of completeness. And then, of course, as you might imagine, we're interested in the version of Rust, the Rust compiler that they have, uh, that users have available. So we've recently convinced the, the PyPA folks to add that. So the data we had gave us reasonable confidence that the vast majority of our users would either be entirely unaffected or would be able to continue using the project with some changes to their build pipeline. But how do we let people know this change is coming so they can make plans and invest in the areas needed to ensure their pro chosen platforms still have access to this project? We first announced that we were considering adding Rust code to PyCA cryptography on August 2020 uh, on our cryptography-dev mailing list, along with a GitHub issue we invited people to comment on. We followed that up with another email in December 2020 that also outlined our general release plan, which we can summarize as the next release, which would be 3.4, would include a Rust extension module, which would be built by default, but would not be required for cryptography to work and could be disabled at build time with an environment variable. The release after that, which we ultimately versioned 35, not 3.4 for reasons, or not 3.5 for reasons we will get into soon, uh, would be built, would include a Rust extension module without which cryptography could not work. In other words, we would depend upon Rust for actual core uh, functionality. This two-step plan was a result of com community feedback, uh, specifically Jeff T. So thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, and designed out of a recognition that very few people follow mailing lists or our issue tracker on a consistent basis. Uh, they wouldn't be aware of this change without us putting it front and center, but breaking them with no escape, escape valve was an anti-goal, right? It was not our desire to break people. So after all this, we released 3.4 on February 7th, 2021. Hooray! Uh, this allowed, uh, allowed us to both let people know Rust was coming, but also let people who weren't quite ready to add the cryptography but don't build Rust flag to their environment variables so they don't have to immediately make changes to their build pipelines. Well, we expected back, uh, feedback, and uh, well, we got it. <laughs> so the vast majority of our users experienced no breakage in this transition. However, amongst the minority who did, and to be very clear, we consider that very minority significant and important to us, there existed a subset who were willing to provide feedback. Uh, it took various forms. It also started getting a bit heated. <laughs> we also saw this release got some attention in places you wouldn't expect. Which ultimately spawned some other articles talking about trade-offs we had chosen to make. So throughout this process, we were taking what we learned from our users and trying to provide improvements as quickly as we could. Uh, first, we got a bug in our new type hints, which there's a lesson there. Don't ship other stuff with your big Rust change. Uh, we also realized we should provide more robust debug output when compilation failed for people who aren't C and Rust experts. Uh, one, of the, one of the unfortunate things when we build these things is we become experts in the very things that are the most opaque to the users who are having problems. So day two was spent <laughs> improving our documentation, making our er errors even more debuggable, and generally learning from user confusion to build more paved roads. And again, don't ship other invasive changes with a Rust transition. After this, we added a test in our CI that tests for all possible import cycles, because that was really annoying. <laughs> and finally, on the 13th, we released a version that dropped our MSRV, or minimum supported Rust version. Uh, and also pre-announced a new versioning scheme. So what lessons did we learn from all this? Well, one common point of feedback we got initially was that while we documented the don't use Rust environment variables in the documentation, it wasn't clearly linked to from either the error message or the change log. The flag was simply not as discoverable as it needed to be. Errors out of PIP when compilation fails can be extraordinarily verbose. Uh, so catching that and then emitting a more friendly message with both a set of relevant environment information as well as links on how to surmount common problems went a long way towards minimizing the time it took users to get their environments working again. This is the difference between a pile of Rust C or uh, GCC failed output and one that has like, like a pretty output that says, hey, look, you should consider doing the following things. And if those fail, please submit an issue. Additionally, for users who were willing to immediately jump into our Rust requirement, we didn't provide enough information about required Rust version or how to obtain it. 
Typically, users obtain their C compiler directly from the operating system, and the version barely matters. But in, our case, in, the, in the Rust case, our minimum supported Rust version was higher than some of the older Debian and Alpine installations, requiring the user to learn how to install Rust up, which is an alternate mechanism of installing these things. These items were uh, potentially foreseeable errors on our part. Our own familiarity with the code base and tooling required resulted in a failure to systematically examine failure cases and think through user experience. We considered some of these, but failed to give the users with problems good enough tools uh, to fix their issues. We also discovered just how many people pinned cryptography assuming semantic versioning. When 3.4 made this change and their build pipelines blew up, this shocked them as they believed we were breaking an unwritten contract. While Alex and I both have very strong feelings about the value of semantic versioning in general, as well as specifically in the case of security critical libraries like cryptography, we also don't want to surprise users. Uh, so accordingly, we reversioned our library such that every feature release is now a new major version, 35.0, 36.0, et cetera, in the vein of Firefox's version numbers. A talk about versioning could fill 30 minutes alone, so if you want our full hot takes, you'll have to find us in the hallway track. <laughs> Finally, when things aren't working and people are under pressure, ten tempers run hot. We had passionate people both defending us and registering their, uh, their objections to some of our decisions. But an issue this emotionally charged results in that defense occasionally looking more like an attack. And many users couldn't tell the difference between those overly zealous defenders and the actual core maintainers. This led to a less civil discourse than we would have preferred. So having shipped a module that incorporates Rust into the build process, but ultimately does nothing of use, the next step was do something useful with Rust, you know, get the value out of it that is the reason we're using it in the first place. Luckily for us, we had a few concrete use cases in mind. First, we wanted to replace the small amount of C code we'd written ourselves for handling things like cryptographic constant time operations. And second, we wanted to replace OpenSSL's X509 layer and all of the parsing code for ASN1 that it contains. There's actually not a ton to be said about the process of replacing these things, because mostly we just stuck to the best practice you'll hear about any time you think about rewriting things. Make sure you have great test coverage. Don't rewrite everything at once. You know, break up your rewrite into small components. Make sure things are working all along the way. Right? Don't leave things in a half-broken state. And so really the process of migrating to Rust is just a series of small pull requests that keep tests running, add new test cases where we got concerned there wasn't enough test coverage, and uh, attempting to measure how we were getting benefit from this. So for example, even though our primary motivation in this effort was security, we also got some really big performance wins. Uh, in the benchmarks we've got here, we migrated the parser for the OCSP request class from uh, an OpenSSL and CFFI implementation to the Rust implementation. And the result is it is now 10 times faster than it used to be. This might come as a surprise. OpenSSL is written in C. C is fast. C may be fast, but it's not magic. OpenSSL's parsing code performs a significant number of allocations and memory copies. Because of Rust safety features, we were able to easily write parsing code without any allocations and without any memory copies, while still having confidence that we weren't introducing these memory safety vulnerabilities we talked about at the top. We also got big benefits out of this in terms of architectural improvements. Uh, specifically, our X509 uh, API's implementation used to be deeply intertwined with the OpenSSL implementation of other components of our library. These means, this meant we'd have APIs that said things like, takes a private key, but in practice would be totally broken if it wasn't an OpenSSL private key. Rewriting this code in Rust let us make the API uh, boundaries between these two components actually much clearer. And now things like sign a certificate with a private key in a cloud key management service actually just works. And here's what our adoption curve looked like. The blue section are downloads of versions with no Rust, the red are versions that contain the optional Rust, and the yellow are versions that require Rust. There's really two things I noticed about this. First, adoption of a new version happens in two phases. First it happens all at once, and then it happens slowly. Immediately after we release a new version, nearly half of our users will be updated, indicating they're almost certainly not using any sort of version or hash pinning. After that, adoption increases very gradually. Right now we're at a point where approximately 80% of our downloads are processed in a facility that contains Rust, and we'd like to get that to 100%, obviously. We know the uh, blue section, the no Rust, is a mix of uh, causes, though. Some of it is folks deliberately pinning to versions before we had Rust. Others of it are users pinning to our 2.x series, presumably because of expectations around semantic versioning that uh, are not actually accurate for us. 
So we hope we've convinced you in this talk that Rust is an a now a viable choice no matter how popular pr your project is. Much of this ecosystem work was done out of necessity, but the vast majority is now complete. Uh, we were also thrilled to see that other developers took up the challenge to implement the Muscle Linux standard across PyPA and PyPI, which gave Alpine Linux users access to wheels much like we already had for Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat, and other glibc-based distributions. And of course, we've hopefully weathered the storm of legitimate concerns, well-meaning but confused people, and angry trolls. If we can do it, so can you. Next time you find yourself reaching for the C, uh, Python C API to eke out some more performance, uh, take a second and maybe reach for a nice cold glass of PyO3. There is, however, room for future improvement here. For example, alternate OSs such as FreeBSD and OpenBSD are still required for, to build from source. Uh, it would be nice to be able to potentially define standards where that is no longer required. Additionally, to streamline the experience even more, we could investigate better binary build tooling, uh, moving, to setup to, uh, moving setup tools Rust into setup tools, or better integrations with CPython itself. The experience today is excellent for most users, but we can make it better. Oh, and uh, as announced via the Python announce list, and in this talk right now, the next release of bcrypt will be pure Rust. Thank you very much.